I've heard nothing but stuff about elections for forever. And unless you've been living on a desert island somewhere without internet, we've got one coming up here in 15, 16 days uh, that's being uh, portrayed as potentially controversial that the person who does not come in first may not accept the results. And of course, the media is making much of this because let's face it, uh, when there's controversy and excitement, people are interested and people watch and it helps their ratings. Well, as a historian, my job is to, uh, among other things, is to uh, study these things uh, over, over time. And uh, if you do, you discover that America has had quite a few controversial elections. Uh, many of you remember 2000, the Bush-Gore debacle, where many of us got calls from friends and relatives up north who said, basically, what's wrong with you people in Florida? Can't you punch a hole in a ballot? Can't you count? Well, this actually has been part of a trend. Uh, Winston Churchill said uh, once that democracy is the most inefficient form of government there is. And you look at all the other ones. In the old Soviet Union, they had close to 100% voter turnout uh, and a perfect election system. Of course, they had one party and uh, you didn't really get to choose very much, but it was perfect. <laughs> now, where should we start? Well, uh, and by the way, all of this will be on the final. Because I know some of you who are Florida Tech alums out there having a flashback to uh, your school days here on campus. And uh, uh, many of our students are learning this way now because of uh, COVID-19. We have to go back to the dawn of the 19th century, the year 1800. Actually, only the second presidential election we had in this country where we had political parties. There were two, the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republicans. Now, don't let that confuse you. Democratic Republicans were Democrats. Later, they dropped the Republican part and just were just flat Democrats. It was a tough year. The Federalist Party split into two warring factions, which is always a bad idea if you want to win presidential elections. The incumbent president, John Adams, uh, was in a feud with uh, another uh, branch of his party, which opened the door for Democratic Republicans. And their star in 1800 was a man named Thomas Jefferson, who ironically, when he died uh, and wrote the things he wanted on his tombstone, being president of the United States was on the list. He has other things, but not being president. Uh, did he want it? Of course. He uh, was hopeful that he would be able to make an arrangement with uh, other Democratic Republicans to get him this, uh, this nomination and, and this election. Now, he was from Virginia, very powerful state. Uh, four of the first five presidents were from Virginia. Well, when Jefferson looked for political help, he looked to New York. And there was a uh, young, ambitious politician named Aaron Burr who saw himself as quite possibly living in the White House. And they made uh, an arrangement in the Electoral College. And remember, while popular votes are great, Electoral College votes get you the job. That the electors were supposed to vote for Thomas Jefferson and uh, Aaron Burr was supposed to come in second by one or two votes uh, and he would be vice president. That's how the system worked then. Whoever came in first electoral votes was president, who came in second vice president. If we had that system today, Donald Trump would be president and Hillary Clinton would be vice president. Obviously, that's not going to work. They changed it in 1804. Well, all right. Electors uh, went to work. And of course, in those days, it took weeks and months uh, to get the results. Uh, we're spoiled. We expected everything by 11 o'clock on election night. Uh, not going to happen this time. And to everybody's horror, there was a tie in the Electoral College. Thomas Jefferson got 71 votes. Aaron Burr got 
actually it was 73, excuse me, 73 votes. 73, 73 tie. One elector messed up. And remember, you can't pick up a cell phone or call somebody. Now, if Aaron Burr had been a gentleman, he would have stuck to the original deal. I'm supposed to come in second. I should be vice president. But Mr. Burr uh, dreamed dreams of being president. And he thought, well, you know, I did as well as that old man, Thomas Jefferson. I could be president. Now, when there's a tie in the electoral college, it's thrown into the House of Representatives where each state gets one vote. When this happened, uh, a lot of members of the Federalist Party found that they were gonna decide the next president. They kind of liked Burr. He was younger. He was closer to them in uh, political views. Why they didn't elect Burr president is that a fellow who's now incredibly famous and a Broadway star named Alexander Hamilton, uh, who was Je Jefferson's arch enemy, said to his Federalist supporters, look, Thomas Jefferson is wrong on all the public issues facing our country today. He doesn't have a clue, but Jefferson is a gentleman. He will do nothing to hurt the country. Burr is not a gentleman vote for Thomas Jefferson. Well, after weeks of balloting in the House, where Jefferson helped himself, he kind of put the word out that he uh, wouldn't cancel the Constitution, which was a nice thing to do, uh, would honor the national debt. He would eventually be elected by the House President of the United States. And Aaron Burr got to be his vice president. Were they close friends, do you think? No. And later, uh, didn't uh, Vice President Burr shoot and kill Alexander Hamilton in a very famous duel in 1804? In fact, Vice President Burr was the first sitting vice president to be indicted for a crime, murder. Not the last, just the first. So Thomas Jefferson uh, has a very controversial uh, entrance to the presidency, and he would refer to it uh, as the revolution of 1800. Because what happened, the Federalists lost and they peacefully transferred power to the Democratic Republicans. They accepted the election results and let bygones be bygones and got on with waiting for the next election. That has been the American tradition. Now, it's kind of interesting when Jefferson was uh, sworn in as president, President John Adams didn't come. He was busy that day. He just, nope, I'm leaving. Uh, ironically, both he and his son, who we're gonna talk about in a minute, John Quincy Adams, both skipped their successor's presidential inauguration. So if somebody were to skip it in January of 2021, there would be precedent for this. Uh, I leave it to your imagination who I'm talking about if it works out that way. Well, all right. Things will be smooth for about 24 years. And by 1824, the Federalist Party's dead. It was like, it, like the dinosaurs, it, it just faded away. The Democratic Republican Party is so big, it's starting to split up. And you had a number of candidates opt for the presidency. Now, there were a whole, whole host of people with tremendous backgrounds and tremendous education, but the one who was the most popular was kind of a wild man from out in Nashville, Tennessee, named Andrew Jackson, who today is so politically incorrect that it's, it's just hard to even talk about him. Uh, you know, he's on the $20 bill, and there's, of course, a, a plan to remove him from the $20 bill. Uh, I don't think he'd mind that much. Uh, he never thought much of paper currency anyway, so it wouldn't, wouldn't bother him. Jackson was a war hero, War of 1812 against the British. Uh, never been to college, never been to high school. In fact, when Harvard gave him an honorary degree, alumni said, my God, we just gave a, a functional illiterate a Harvard degree. Uh, 
Jackson spelled words the way he thought they should be spelled and didn't really care how they came out. Spell checker would have changed his life, definitely. Well, in the election of 1824, he comes in first. He has more electoral votes than anybody, more popular votes. But because there were so many people running, not enough to win outright. So we know what happens when you have a lot of candidates and uh, you have to decide who the finalist is. You have a runoff election. Well, the runoff election is held in the House of Representatives. One state, one vote. Now, one of the people who ran in 1824 was uh, a fellow named Henry Clay. When Andrew Jackson went on, was on his deathbed, he said, you know, there's uh, two things I wish I had done in my life that I didn't, but I wish I had. One of them was shooting Henry Clay. The other was hanging John C. Calhoun. Clay was an incredibly ambitious politician. In fact, would run for the presidency at least four times and never win. He's the fellow who said, I'd rather be right than be president. Well, he was right a lot because he never made it. Well, in 1824, he's Speaker of the House of Representatives. Well, House of Representatives is going to decide the new president. Now, he can't make a deal for himself because that, that would look right. It's either Andrew Jackson or John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams, who had a, a tremendous reputation himself. Wasn't a terribly good politician, but uh, an able man. Well, nobody has ever proved this. Everybody denied it. But we're pretty sure that Speaker Clay and John Quincy Adams got together and played uh, a version of that old game that we used to love so much. Let's make a deal. Well, what does Henry Clay have that John Quincy Adams might want? The presidency. Clay can arrange for his people to vote for Adams and give him the White House. Okay. What does Henry Clay want in return? Well, he wanted a new job. He wanted to be Secretary of State. Now you might say, why? He's Speaker of the House of Representatives. Well, in those days, being the Secretary of State was considered one of the springboards to being president. Today, it really isn't, really. Uh, Vice President is a springboard, senators, governors maybe, uh, not Secretary of State. But in those days, good place to be. Well, House of Representatives, after weeks of wrangling, gets together. And uh, one fellow who was sitting there was trying to find something to do, some way to go forward. He closed his, his eyes and said a silent prayer. And when he opened his eyes, he saw on the floor a ballot that somebody had thrown away with the name Adams on it. He said, this is a sign. God wants me to vote for John Quincy Adams. So he did. And Adams would be elected to the presidency by the House of Representatives. A week later, Henry Clay is named Secretary of State. Hmm. He would deny there was a deal. President Adams would deny there was a deal. But ladies and gentlemen, there's an old rule in politics. If it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Andrew Jackson, the man who came into this with more popular votes, more electoral votes, got nothing. To say he was perturbed is the understatement of the 19th century. Jackson had a furious fit. He referred to this as the corrupt bargain. And Henry Clay was the Judas of the West who sold out American democracy for a job. And he swore vengeance. Well, Adams was legally president and he would uh, not do very well as president. He didn't understand the changing politics. 
Adams and his people uh, almost immediately in 1825 started attacking him. And we think we live in, a, in an age where a lot of mud is thrown. A lot of outrageous charges are made against political candidates. Ladies and gentlemen, the folks out there now are amateurs compared to our 19th century leaders. The Jackson folks said that President John Quincy Adams installed gambling equipment in the White House. He set up a gambling casino. Could this be true? No. He bought a pool table and a chess set, which he paid for out of his own money. Now, can a pool table or a chess set be considered gambling equipment? If you gamble on the games, I suppose. But people thought roulette wheels, you know, Texas Hold'em poker. No. The worst one was they said that President Adams, when he was the U.S. ambassador to Russia, had basically been a pimp for the czar of Russia, had got him innocent girls. No. Now, don't worry, the Adams people answered in kind. They said that uh, Andrew Jackson was a gambler, which he was. They said that uh, he had killed people in duels, which he had. And they said that he was a bigamist, that he had two spouses at the same time. Not true. Turned out his wife, Rachel, was something of a bigamist. Uh, she was still married to her first husband when they married. So their marriage wasn't valid. Very embarrassing. Now, all these charges, the American people in 1828 would elect uh, Andrew Jackson hands down. Uh, so he would bounce back from this very, very quickly. And Jackson's eight years as president would be one huge <laughs> controversy. Though actually he would not, he would be the only two term president until Abraham Lincoln. As he would manage to be elected twice. Just out of curiosity, Jackson was the first president that anybody tried to assassinate. He was going somewhere and a guy came up to him and tried to fire two pistols at him, both of which misfired. Well, the crowd didn't jump on the shooter. They jumped on President Jackson, who was attempting to kill the person who tried to shoot at him with his cane and probably would have if, if the crowd hadn't held him back. Uh, presidents really didn't have secret service protection until after that, that bad thing for Abraham Lincoln. Because who would kill a president? Now, when we're looking for controversy, we're looking for confusion. Now, by the time we get to the 1850s, it's everywhere. In fact, they refer to the leadership then, presidents on down, as the blundering generation. You know, we, uh, we rank presidents, historians do, it gives us something to do every few years. And uh, we're pretty sure that Abraham Lincoln uh, is the greatest president of them all. Who's the worst? Well, that changes. Believe it or not, it was never Richard Nixon. He was never at the uh, bottom, though he resigned in disgrace, excuse me. It's probably Richard Nixon calling in now to complain. Today, the last person is uh, James Buchanan. And the person before that is uh, Franklin uh, Pierce, both presidents of the 1850s. Uh, didn't have a clue. In 1860, the United States decided or tried to elect another president, not James Buchanan. Old Buck was, was done. Well, we had two political parties in the country. The Democrats are still around. And they, of course, are badly divided. Northern wing, Southern wing. What's the issue tearing them apart? Slavery and the extension of slavery westward. There were very few abolitionists who wanted slavery abolished. They just didn't want it to spread. But when Southerners heard that, they assumed, oh, well, 
if slavery is not allowed to spread, it will die. Now, those of you who know anything about marine biology know that sharks and whales have to continue swimming so they can feed. Well, slavery has to keep expanding or it'll die. So anyone who says contain it, they really mean kill it. Well, what the Democratic Party needed in 1860 was a convention where they could calmly and coolly work out their differences and come up with uh, a candidate. And actually, I'll get to the third party in, in, in a second. Unfortunately, their convention was in Charleston, South Carolina, the most radical Southern city in the most radical Southern state. Somebody said that uh, South Carolina was uh, too small to be a republic and too big to be an insane asylum. So they're very hardcore there. The Democratic Convention collapses in chaos. In fact, I'm always reminded of the, uh, the 1930s uh, comedian, Will Rogers, when asked, do you belong to an organized political party? He said, no, I don't. I'm a Democrat. Democrats will laugh. Republicans will say, yes, yes, yes. Well, the party splits. The Northern branch goes for a fellow who'd been lusting after the presidency for at least 10 years. A guy named Stephen A. Douglas. He was known as the little, the little giant because he was short and very, very fiery. Also a raging alcoholic. There's no doubt that in less than two years, he'd drink himself to death. Well, he really had no chance of bridging the Northern and Southern wings of the Democratic Party. He needed to step aside for a compromised candidate but he wouldn't do it. So he ended up the nominee of the Northern Democrats, half the party. Well, the Southerners, they sort of organize on their own and they opt for a guy named John C. Breckenridge. Breckenridge was uh, from Kentucky. Uh, he was uh, Buchanan's vice president and was one of the youngest people to hold that particular office. Well, okay, so the Democratic Party has split. Opening for the new kids on the block, the Republican Party. Now, people are arguing to this day where the Republican Party was actually founded. Some say it was Wisconsin, some say it's Michigan. Uh, we will never know for sure. The meetings may have happened at the same time. Well, these wild Republicans they came from nowhere, born in 1854, running people for president by 1856, and by 1860, threatening to take the White House. Well, the Republicans were a, a, a wild grab bag group of people, uh, many anti-slavery people, but very few abolitionists. It's a big difference between the two. Uh, there were zero Southern Republicans because this, the Republican Party was seen as the anti-slavery party. In fact, if you wanted to go uh, in the South in 1860 and commit suicide in a very interesting way, I would suggest going to any Southern city and saying, hey, I'm a Republican, right here, Republican, and wait for the mob. It wouldn't take long. And I know that sounds so strange to people because today the, the South is one of the Republican Party's uh, strongholds. Uh, what would happen, just, just, just to fill this in, uh, over time, Southern Democrats got used to voting for Republican presidents, even though they didn't like it much, but they did it anyway. And eventually by the 1960s and beyond, Southerners would say, well, I keep voting for Southerners as president. Heck, I might as well join the, the grand old party. Well. A lot of Republicans want to be president in 1860. One who had, as it turned out, the best shot was a great big tall fellow from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln. And of course, we all have a vision of Abraham Lincoln. One of the things we think about is the beard, which he did not have yet. Uh, when he was campaigning for president after winning the nomination, a little girl, it's a true story, in New York wrote him a letter. Dear Mr. Lincoln, just saw your picture. You're not very good looking. 
have you ever considered growing a beard? And Lincoln being Lincoln would say, well, you're right, I'm not all that look good looking, I'll grow a beard. So he did, it did save him time in the morning. And of course he had that great big hat. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, Abraham Lincoln used that hat as his briefcase. He would stick papers up there, maybe an apple for lunch. You know, he, he's a lawyer, he needs, he needs a place to put his papers. Well, Lincoln wanted to be president. In fact, he would tell friends, I kind of have the taste of it in my mouth. But he told his friends going to the convention, I want no slick political deals made for me. If I get it, honestly, fine. If I don't, okay. Well, his friends went to the convention, which was in Chicago that year, and absolutely forgot that. They made every slick political deal they possibly could. Lincoln would win on the third ballot. Why? Well, Lincoln is a ex-Whig. He's a now Republican. He's solidly anti-slavery, though not an abolitionist. Abraham Lincoln, ironically, would never be considered an abolitionist. Uh, he is from originally Kentucky, lived in Indiana, is now in Illinois. So he has footholds in three states. Now, when you're running for president, at least it used to be, the, the more states you could come from, the better it would be for you. No, I'm not sure it, it, it matters all that much. But back then it did. And Lincoln's story. He really was a rags to riches story. And they made a lot of that. You know, Abraham Lincoln, the rail splitter, walked two miles to return a nickel, all this stuff. Uh, Lincoln was a successful corporate lawyer. Though he had worked his way up. The American people looked at the choice in 1860. They got three choices now. You got Douglas, the Democrat, you have Breckenridge, the Southern Democrat, and you got this Lincoln guy, the Republican. And their response in a lot of cases was, well, don't like any of them. So a third party popped up. Uh, and there had been third parties. And, and to answer the, uh, the, the Glenn's question, uh, Third party candidates have done a lot, not necessarily to elect candidates, but to put forth ideas. Uh, things like uh, social security and the women's right to vote came from third parties, not the, uh, the two main ones. We're on the third American political party system now, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, it's been that way since the 1850s. Is it always gonna be Republicans and Democrats? I don't think so. Uh, right now, and I know you all can't answer, but you would be stunned to learn that the biggest political party in this country is people who don't belong to a political party. Independence. Uh, the regular parties on both sides are shrinking. So somebody's going to take advantage of that someday. Uh, sooner rather than later, I think. Well, okay, let's have a third party. So in 1860, they create one called the Constitutional Union Party. What's it for? The Constitution and the Union. That's it. They nominate a guy named John Bell, uh, former Speaker of the House from Tennessee. And of course, if you're John Bell and you're running for president, you know what your symbol is, the Liberty Bell. And every time he had a, like a, a, a political event, they would ring bells, like drove people crazy. So now there are four people on the ballot. You can vote for Douglas, you can vote for Breckenridge, you can vote for Lincoln or John Bell. Now in those days, the ballot you got depended on where you lived. Now, uh, for those of you who are, are, have already voted, uh, I, I have, frankly, uh, you may have noticed that there were several names on there for president that you'd never heard of, frankly. I think one, one guy was named Rocky. I'm very curious about who that is. Uh, but we've only heard of basically two. If you lived in Florida, your choices were Breckenridge or Douglas. Up north, it might be Lincoln and Douglas, Lincoln and Bell, 
Bell and Douglas. Uh, of course, you could always write in whoever you wanted, even then. Uh, Lincoln's name did not appear on any Southern ballot at all. Uh, he probably got a couple of write-in votes, but no, he's, he's not an option for Southerners. Well, all right, by 1860, America is wired for telegraph. So news comes in much faster. And it turns out to be a big night for the new Republicans. Lincoln comes in first with 180 electoral votes. Must have been quite a moment for him. Actually, when he got the word, he, he said, excuse me, gentlemen, I've got to go home and tell Mrs. Lincoln. And she's more excited about this than I am. She, she wants to be first lady in the, in the worst way. And if, you, if you've seen the movie Lincoln, you know that Mrs. Lincoln and Abraham had a complicated relationship. In fact, he was probably a battered husband. She would hit him. In fact, once she hit him with a piece of firewood because he said she he wasn't paying attention to her. I'll tell you, somebody hits me in the face with a piece of firewood, I'm paying attention. They got it. In fact, it broke his nose. Well, he wins. If you're interested, uh, Breckenridge came in second with 79 uh, electoral votes. And remember, those are the ones that are count. Uh, Bell came in with 32, not bad for a, a third party nobody ever heard of. And Douglas, well, 12, didn't work for him. Great news. Unfortunately, Mr. Lincoln, the winner, got 39% of the popular vote. 60% of the American electorate voted for somebody else other than the winner. How would we respond to that today? I don't think we'd be very happy. I think the electoral college would be an endangered species if that happened today. Well, it happened. Would folks accept a peaceful transition of power in 1860? Southerners said, hell no, y'all. We will not accept a Republican president don't care who he is, don't care what he said. He belongs to an abolitionist party. That's the end of slavery. That's the end of our civilization. No. And seven states, as a lot of you know, did something about it. They resigned from the United States. Uh, a, a, a kind of a wreath of states from South Carolina all the way to Texas seceded from the union. No, we will not participate. I think that counts as the most controversial presidential election we've, we've had to date. That wins hands down. Now, somebody always asked me about secession. Uh, before the Civil War, this was a very gray area, constitutionally speaking. Could a state leave? Yes, no. Uh, of course, the Civil War kind of put an end to that. Though you still hear secession movements every once in a while. Uh, there's one in Texas one in Northern California, people in Hawaii are talking about it. Usually when people talk about seceding from the union today, it has something to do with the Internal Revenue Service. They think that if they leave the United States, they won't have to pay federal income taxes anymore. As if in an independent country, they wouldn't have to pay taxes, They'd have to pay more taxes. Well, this leads to the Civil War or uh, the war between the states or whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, wiped out 2% of the population. And just as an aside, in 1864, when it was time for another presidential election, we have never missed one. There were folks who came to Lincoln who said, you know, maybe we should postpone this election. Maybe we should just wait. We can't. The country is in the middle of the Civil War. And Lincoln said, absolutely not. If we don't have this election, that means the rebels have won. That means democracy is dead. We will have it. And Lincoln, for most of 1864, is pretty sure he was going to lose. His approval ratings were microscopic if they'd had such things. Uh, and they even there was a lot of even voting by mail. Uh, soldiers in many many Union Army regiments got to vote uh, in the field, and nobody had a problem with it. Well, we know how the Civil War comes out, though 
some have argued that uh, in some ways the Civil War is still going on because we're still fighting about the issues of that, of that conflict. Does democracy really work? Uh, what do we do about race relations in America? It sounds like the things we're grappling with now. And remember our uh, founding fathers, and they had help from the founding mothers too, they were founding mothers, promised us a more perfect union. They didn't promise us a perfect union. They knew better. And this leads us to kind of the last controversial election I'm gonna talk about. I mean, it happens in the year 1876, America's centennial year, 100 years. Uh, the United States had been reconstructing from the Civil War. And it's kind of interesting. You know, today when the United States fights a war with another country, we damage it badly. And then we spend billions of dollars to rebuild it better than it was before we blew it up. There was no aid for the South after the Civil War. There was, there was no reconstruction money. South had to rebuild itself. Well, okay. Uh, in that year, the Democratic Party, which had taken a shellacking all through the 1860s, thought they had a good chance. Uh, the American people were a little tired of the Republican Party. They'd had eight years of President U.S. Grant, great general, terrible president. Uh, everybody in his administration stole except him. He wasn't smart enough to steal, frankly. Uh, they think that it's time for Democrat to be back. And they nominate a fellow from New York, again, New York, named Samuel Tilden. Now, Tilden had made a reputation for himself as a uh, reformer. Uh, he had fought corruption in New York City. I know you're shocked, corruption in New York. Uh, had been governor of New York. And uh, a lot of folks felt that he would be a real contender. Well, the Republicans know he's going to be a real contender. And after the Civil War, if you were going to run uh, as a certainly Republican president, you got to have a, a Civil War battle record. Well, the guy they went to was named Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio. Ohio uh, would become, uh, like Virginia, like New York, one of those states we look to to provide presidents. Well, Hayes was not a superstar by any means, but he had a good reputation as being honest and forthright. Not very exciting, but hey, there it goes. Uh, his wife was uh, actually more exciting because she was an ardent uh, um, anti-alcohol advocate. When she later became first lady, she banned alcohol from the White House, which meant the politicians didn't like to go there. They used to tease her and call her Lemonade Lucy. Because they went to the White House, that's all you got was warm lemonade. They wanted something else. Mm -hmm. Well, all right, the American people go to the polls and it looks great for Governor Tilden. He comes in ahead of Hayes. Wow, happy days are here again. Until Republicans noticed, and boy, is this gonna sound familiar, that the returns from three Southern states were still in dispute. One was South Carolina, one was Louisiana, and one was Florida. Not sure who won those states. In fact, somebody got a pencil, did some quick math. If Republicans could take those three states, Hayes would win by one electoral vote. So what are we going to do? There's a fight in Congress. In fact, there were people in the North Democrats screaming Tilden or blood. If Tilden doesn't get in, we're gonna fight. Well, Southerners didn't say that. Southerners had just been through a civil war. They don't need to see any more blood. And frankly, they didn't care which of these two Yankees was their next president. It doesn't mean much to them. But three Southern states are gonna decide which of them gets the job. So you're gonna be shocked that a arrangement was put together that people deny ever happened. People deny they were there. Uh, I'll get the electoral college. Uh, people, uh, you know, the duck was quacking again. 
The three southern states would go for Hayes if, one, U.S. troops were pulled out of those three states. Reconstruction's over. Two, the Republican Party can form a Republican Party in the South. That's great. But no African Americans. One race only. And we want one person in the Hayes cabinet from the South. We don't care what job he gets. Well, by an amazing coincidence, all three of those things came to pass. And the folks in Congress got together and created a Congressional Election Committee. Actually, Speaker Pelosi has already suggested forming one already uh, to look at the disputes from these three states and decide who won. Well, when they put these, uh, this committee together, there were eight Republicans and seven Democrats. Well, they decided that all three of these states should go to Hayes by an eight to seven vote. Strict party line. Now, in all fairness, Hayes probably would have won those states anyway. There was so much voter intimidation and violence. Uh, pretty soon they're calling him eight to seven Hayes or rather fraud be Hayes. Mumbling, grumbling, but no blood. Uh, Hayes would turn out to be a lackluster president, only stayed four years and got out as fast as he could. Uh, but this was a time that the United States, again, tested the bounds of its electoral system. Uh, one last one, you could say that 1960 was a, was a controversial election. Uh, it used to be the closest in American history, now it's second. Uh, we know today that there were probably shenanigans helping the John F. Kennedy campaign. In fact, he was so popular, we know that in Illinois, dead people voted for JFK. And I don't have a problem with that. Why shouldn't zombies be allowed to vote? Uh, some people were so thrilled they voted for him more than once. The person who lost, Richard Nixon, considered a recount, but was talked out of it. He said, you dispute, dispute this election, it's going to kill you politically. Don't do it. Kennedy's hustled you, suck it up. So controversy is in the American political system. So if we have a dust up this time where it takes days or maybe weeks to find out the winner, don't worry, it's an American family tradition. Now I have a great question here that somebody asked and uh, it's about the electoral college. When I explain this to my students, I know I'm running out of time. Uh, students ask me, well, what conference is the electoral college in? SEC, Big 10? I'm like, no, they don't play football. They're not the fighting electors. How this system got set up in the constitution back in 1787, the folks then were not sure that Americans could be trusted to make good choices. You know, education levels were low and they were afraid that demagogues and would-be dictators could fool the American people. So this electoral college system was a democratic small d safeguard. In theory, the Electoral College could say the folks that you elected uh, aren't any good and we're going to pick somebody else. Now, would they? Haven't yet. In fact, recently the Supreme Court ruled that an elector can't be a what they call a faithless elector. If you're selected to support, you know, Biden or Trump, you got to vote for Biden or Trump. You can't say, let's forget that and vote for Oh, I don't know anybody. Uh, right now, you see uh, trends to get rid of it. Well, I say no, and I'll tell you why. If we went to popular votes only, and I'm running for president, I would pick out the 10 or 15 most popular states, campaign in them, and forget the rest. How much reputation would Rhode Island, Hawaii, Alaska, or North Dakota get? None. Uh, now, can the system be modified? Yes. Uh, what I would do is I would say, okay, whoever comes in first in popular votes gets an electoral college bonus. Extra, extra, extra votes. I don't know how many. You know, we give uh, athletes signing bonuses when they sign up for their teams. Why can't we give uh, presidential candidates a signing bonus if they came in first? That way, 
The person who wins always wins in the electoral college. All the states get a shot at representation and the majority of the American electorate has its say. And that idea has been kicking around for a while. I suspect soon there's gonna be some modifications because this was a 18th century mechanism that Americans don't understand. And part of it's the media's problem. We think that uh, on the night of the election, it's over. No, <laughs> the electoral college has to meet, they have to vote and those votes have to be certified by Congress. Uh, but they never cover that because it's always just automatic. Well, this time, I'm not so sure it's gonna be automatic. Okay, anybody else have any questions out there that I can answer? Any complaints, of course, go to Jill or Cindy. Help me out. Type it away. Hello? Ah. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by national. Okay. When was it changed to a two party system? Ah, okay. That one I can answer. Uh, it kind of came naturally that there would be two main political parties. Uh, we're on, we're on the third American political party system. It started off as Federalists and Democratic Republicans. Then it became Democratic Republicans and Whigs. Uh -huh. Then it became Democrats and Republicans. And that's where we are now. That's why I say it's not forever. Uh, and it's become traditional, frankly. Uh, the political parties have a lot to do with running elections because they tend to dominate various states. Uh, Congress is organized based on political party. If we got rid of, rid of the political parties, Congress would be more disorganized than it is now. Uh, and that, that wouldn't be so good. Okay. Uh, do you have a prediction on who might win the year's election? Well, if I did, uh, I would leave here today, get on an airplane, go to Las Vegas and put some money down because you know there they bet on anything. Uh, I don't know. The polls tell us Biden's ahead. To quote a great philosopher, it's not over till it's over. Uh, I think it's closer than you might think. It is very difficult to unseat an incumbent president no matter how unpopular that person might be. So we, we, we literally have to wait and see. Okay, here's another one here. Making the Speaker of the House and the leader in the Senate nationally elected positions. Mm, that, that might be problematic. Uh, when they wrote the constitution, they thought about giving us three presidents uh, just so one person wouldn't have all the power well, the Roman Republic had three leaders and that didn't work so well. They ended up with a dictator. So I, th I think that might just create more, more problems than it is uh, worth. Okay. Uh, we will create the most discord. What will happen if the president refuses to leave the White House? Well, he gets to stay there until January of uh, 2021. That's when his term officially comes up. And on that day, he becomes Mr. Trump. Uh, and he can be escorted from the building. Uh, probably the courts will be involved. The military will not be involved. They have already said that they, that's no, that's radioactive to them. Uh, I'm very proud of our military institutions because they wanna be certain that they don't become politicized. No, uh, courts may be, may, may be involved. Though I just heard that uh, President Trump today said that if he loses, he might just leave the country and never come back. Uh, anything is, uh, is possible. Uh, I hope that in a minute of uh, calm and, and maturity that the loser whoever it might be, realizes that for the good of the country, they have to be bigger 
than themselves. And just sort of take a look at the past uh, and see how people handled this. So anyway, uh, I think uh, we maybe have time for one more. Let me see here. There's so many good ones. Uh, okay. What 2020 election scenario are you worried will create the most controversy and discord? Well, what is probably going to happen, and we've, we've already seen this, is the mail-in ballots. Now, I will tell you, I voted by mail for years. I, I like it. Uh, I know some people like to go and stand in line and punch a hole, or, or they don't even do that anymore, call in a little circle. Though I did uh, drop mine off personally at the voter place. Uh, everybody's got to find their own way uh, to do this. Uh, I think that when it happens, there are going to be battalions of lawyers deployed in states to file lawsuits uh, against everything. Now, you know, the term, uh, my lawsuit might be frivolous, but your lawsuit's very, very important. Uh, the courts will, will be involved in it. What we have to have is uh, a clear winner. And the American people have to see that this was done in a proper, honest, legal manner. Uh, somebody here question, uh, extreme right wing. Well, uh, those folks, uh, and you know, I'm asked by students about this. Those people are the price that we pay to live in a, in a, in a democracy. I mean, you have the right to believe just about anything you want, no matter how out there it is. Uh, you have a right to dress up in army surplus clothes if you want to. You even and can carry around a machine gun if you want to. But you're not allowed to act on it. Uh, when you do that, that's a problem. Uh, do I think there's going to be gunfire and fighting in the streets? No. Of course, in some American cities, uh, if you go into some of those neighborhoods, it's not a good idea. I always think of the great line from the movie Casablanca with the Nazi officers telling Humphrey Bogart, what would you feel about our armies in New York City? And he said, there are neighborhoods in New York City I'd stay out of if I were you Germans. Don't go in there. Uh, who knows? Okay, what are your thoughts about recent attempts to cancel our history? Uh, history is a darn controversial subject. Uh, it really cranks people up. And one of our problems is nationally, our historical legacy is not very good. Uh, it's my guild's fault, frankly. We sit around and we mumble and grumble about it, but we don't do much about it. Uh, History, somebody once said, is like a mansion. It's got many rooms. And there's room for, for different interpretations. Uh, I don't think history should be homogenized and sanitized, uh, like some people believe, because that's not history. That's propaganda. Uh, I'm not in favor of taking down the statues. Uh, I think they can be used as teaching tools. You know, if you go to Germany, and some of you probably have, you can go to a place near Munich called Dachau, the concentration camp. It's still there. And wouldn't you think the Nazis would want to bulldoze that place? Or the Germans, excuse me, bulldoze it, forget that horrible thing? No. They take German school kids there because they don't want them to forget. Uh, and that's what I would do with the statues. I would use them. Now, changing the uh, military bases? Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Braxton Bragg does not deserve to have an army base named after him, if you know anything about Civil War history. Uh, and soldiers there, frankly, and I've talked to a lot of soldiers, they don't worry too much about what their base is named. That's not something that keeps them awake at night. So hopefully uh, things will turn out all right. I think they will. We've, we've come through a lot as a nation, and we'll get through this. We'll get through this. Uh, all we can do is hope. Well, I think I have run out of time. And actually, I am on time, which for me never happens. Uh, alert the media. Jeez. 
Uh, I want to thank everybody who came, everybody who asked such good questions, and uh, you know all of you who registered for this and uh, your interest in this shows that you you care about this country. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to have been here today. Thanks a lot. Now turn it back to our our hosts. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Um, that was very informative. Um, and thank you for taking all of our questions. Um, we appreciate your, your informed perspective on that and um, your insight. Um, I also wanted to thank all of our alumni again for tuning in uh, to learn something during lunch with us. We have another Lunch and Learn uh, virtually next Tuesday on the climate tipping point in the Amazon. And that will be with um, faculty member, Dr. Mark Bush, who um, is a biology professor in marine sciences, and he teaches many courses. Uh, so that should be great. So if you're interested and you haven't registered, I put the link in the chat box, um, or you can find it on the alumni website, which is fit.edu slash alumni slash events. And you'll see all the, the virtual events we have coming up. Um, if you're a fan of, of Harry Potter, we have a Halloween themed uh, trivia night next Wednesday. Uh, so check out all of our events on our alumni website, and we hope to see you all virtually sometime soon. Take care. <laughs>